My name is Tom Warnert. I'm the sales manager here at Lakos Filtration for both our industrial and our commercial heat transfer or HVAC um, filtration divisions. I've been with Lakos, well, three decades, but in the last 15 years specifically, I've focused on our international and domestic industrial and heat transfer um, filtration sales. Regarding data centers, this is about data centers, and cooling water, and filtration. There's a lot of information we can cover, but within the next 30, 35 minutes, um, I can't do it all. There's a lot of niches we can go into, and I'll be happy to take people's questions and comments later. But today, we're gonna focus on an overview of the concerns in dealing with cooling tower systems, uh, the available options uh, for filtration, and hopefully some solutions for you. Before we get into the thick of things, I want to provide a little introduction on who Lakos is and what Lakos is. Lakos was founded in 1972, so 48 years ago now, as a water filtration company here, based here in Fresno, California. That's where I am right now. I'm in the office in Fresno, California. We have over 120,000 square feet of manufacturing, all of our manufacturing here, our sales, engineering, accounting, everything's here. Uh, under this facility in Fresno. We manufacture and sell filtration products for commercial HVAC applications, uh, specifically data centers, retail outlets, hospitality, healthcare, education, also for industrial facilities. And we also have our industrial, municipal, and irrigation groundwater divisions located here as well. And Industrially and, in, and through our irrigation groundwater, we use completely different distribution. We do have a worldwide distribution network throughout US and the rest of the world, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But all of our products are so, most of our products are sold through distribution. We do some OEM and direct sales, but most, I'll say 95% of what we do is through distribution. Now, the reason why you're here, what can Lakos do for you? I know you're here, you want to hear what, what's going on, but I kind of like giving you a little bit of the dessert now. At the end of the day, Lakos is a product that will continuously remove dirt, debris, particulates, however you want to call it, and other particles from cooling towers, heat exchangers, and chillers, and, and related piping. This is all about cooling water systems and data centers. And these are the main components that we're going to be dealing with, and of course, you operators are going to be most concerned with. So therefore, Lakos is helping heat transfer equipment operate at their design efficiencies. So especially the heat exchangers and the chillers, we're making sure that they transfer heat effectively. And we can do all this, I mean, really with zero maintenance to our equipment and really the lowest water loss uh, in, in the industry. And I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute as well. So therefore, Lakos filtration offers the most effective, as we feel, uh, filtration solutions for data centers. Now for the agenda today, we're gonna look at top concerns of water-cooled data center operators. We're gonna look at particle sources and the accumulation of particles in cooling towers, filtration types that are available. We're gonna look at water filtration options and challenges. Then we're gonna look at some LACO solutions and operating cost analyses. And then at the end, we wanna look at some questions about you operators in selecting a filtration that fits your application. Because we know from geography and precipitation conditions and water conditions, all these different factors make every location somewhat unique to the operators. So first, data centers, top concerns. Now the first five, points are actually from, and I have it very small, I don't know if you can read that, but our source is the Uptime Institute survey. This was done in April. And the Uptime Institute is really an organization of designers and builders and, and maintenance people for, for data centers. And this institute did a survey on really what are the top concerns for operators. And of course, loss of business revenue and demand is always going to be that, especially as more and more facilities are built and are they staying relevant with the needs of us, the consumers who are utilizing and storing data, concerned about maintaining service level agreements, concerned about maintenance, staffing, and IT infrastructure, 
project and construction delays, scheduled maintenance of all types of equipment that are in these data centers. Because if you look at, go online, look at a picture of a data center, you don't ever see a human. There's not very many people operating these. Then at the end of that, I added one more point. It says water and power usage effectiveness. PUE, power and water effectiveness in the, in the plants. These are very important aspects as well. They just weren't part of this particular survey. I highlighted maintenance, scheduled maintenance, and water and power usage. These are areas that LACOS can help directly. Now, before we can get into what we can do, we kind of have to know how is the problem created in the first place. So we want to look at sources of particulate in two cooling towers. So what I'm showing here, you know, these are depictions of cooling towers. And first source, and oftentimes the primary source of particulate into cooling towers and to the cooling water system is airborne. Airborne debris, whether you're built out in the country away from population centers, or if the data center is downtown um, out in the country, you're getting a lot of wind blown dirt, especially around farming areas. In the city, you're getting a lot of airborne road dust, brake dust, also wind. So you're, these are, this is your major point of entry of a lot of solids. Second point of entry is your water supply. Your makeup water is coming from somewhere. And that makeup water is coming through piping that may or may not be of this century. So oftentimes water is coming in with particulate from pipe scale, pipe rust. It also might be coming in with sand and silt from the actual water source. And the third point of entry is actually not point of entry, it's actually what's in the water itself. Water obviously is H2O, but most water has calcium or magnesium or some iron and some other minerals within the water that as the water evaporates or is used in the heat transfer process, um, it leaves behind these excess um, minerals and as these minerals build up they can cause of course scale and as that scale builds up it will end up in the water as particulate actual particulate so then we start looking at how lack of filtration will affect the performance of the system and i mentioned at the very beginning there's three major components within the cooling water system it's your cooling towers your chillers and your heat exchangers I'm not even mentioning all the piping in between where solids can settle out, but these main areas here, especially the cooling tower basins, they are generally a, a, a flat area where water and solids can settle. Uh, these require frequent cleaning of the cooling towers. And as the fill also above that, you've got the basin where the solids collect, but solids also can collect in the fill because you have water coming in. And as that fill gets loaded, more loaded, it also contributes to heat transfer loss. And then of course, as this dirt builds up, it can send dirt downstream to other equipment. So this is a problem about this accumulation of cooling towers. Now in the chillers, chiller tubes require frequent cleaning. And that's because solids, they're nice. There's a lot of miles of tubing in these chillers. And as the water goes through the chillers, and especially bins in the chillers, they are great collectors for dirt. And as the dirt builds up, dirt sludge builds up, they start losing their heat transfer capabilities. So of course, requiring now more energy consumption and therefore they need cleaning. Same thing with heat exchangers. These plate and flame heat exchangers honestly make a great filter. As the water goes through that series of pathways, they get blocked and filled with sludge. And of course, they need frequent cleaning as well to maintain their heat exchanger capabilities. Otherwise, you've got increased energy consumption here as well. So all these areas are prone to settling of solids. And of course, if solids settle in them, that's going to affect their effectiveness. So once we identify the problems, now we got to look at what are the options. In a water-cooled system with cooling tower, heat exchangers and chillers, there's three applications we're looking at. First application is basin sweeping. This is where, in fact, what I'm showing here, this is depiction of a cooling tower. This is the basin. And in basin cleaning, what we do is we focus on just keeping the basin clean. Forget about the rest of the system at this moment. 
Just think about a dialysis machine that just turns the water over in the basin with a filtration system that just removes particles from the basin. So this would have a series of, of nozzles within the basin that continually sweep particles as they enter towards pump suction for the filtration system. And as the dirt is removed with the filtration system, the clean water is, moved, is just fed back to the nozzles to keep the process going. So one, basin sweeping. Second option is side stream cleaning. Now that's is taking a percentage of the total flow of your system. So suppose you've got a thousand GPM system flow for your cooling. You're gonna take a percentage of that flow and filter that. So we're taking the system flow, we're taking a side stream of that, and that will be anywhere from 25%, that's more of a traditional amount, all the way down, honestly, down to 3%. Nowadays, with competition and more and more push towards making things less expensive, here's the economical solution, and that's why people like the side stream. They move towards more and more, or uh, actually with less and less filtration uh, on, on the side stream. So that's something we'll talk about in a minute about that issue, but that's another option. And what's nice about this option though, there are some benefits. It's easy to retrofit, um, it is more economical, and also it can fit in a mechanical room. So sometimes there's not space outside, and if you've got space in the mechanical room, the system could actually go there. And the third option is full stream. This is what we would all want. If you've got a thousand gallon a minute system, let's filter a thousand gallons a minute. Let's do it all, all the time. Um, that gives you 100% filtration of the total system flow. This can be used for point of use filtration downstream where you can do 100% filtration in front of a heat exchanger or a chiller system. The only downside here is that you're not doing anything with the basin itself. All the dirt that actually comes into the basin will settle through the fill and it will settle in the basin. So that's the downside of this. Downside also is it's not really not really set up for a retrofit application. Yeah, it's usually the piping and the pump system is set up in advance, and especially the pressure available at this pump is set up in advance where you may not have that capability later on to add a full stream system. So if you're gonna do this, do this in the original design, okay? Now, I wanted to throw in one more thing here too, especially when we're talking about cooling towers and, and piping systems. Water filtration is mechanical. We're taking solids out of the water, but I don't wanna have anybody think that that's a magic pill to keep a system completely clean. Water filtration should always be combined with a water treatment regimen, because water treatment is, is what's gonna kill any of that biological growth. It'll help keep scale from building up. And again, depending upon the chemistry in the system, wherever these cooling towers are and the data centers are located, your water treatment system should match the need locally. So now, looking at the problems, where we can put filtration, now we start looking at your water filtration technologies and your options. And there's two basic types of technologies, really basic. You've got barrier filters and you've got non-barrier filters. Your barrier filters have a filter media, whether it's sand media, screen, uh, either or bag or cartridge filters, there's gonna always be a barrier or a media that's gonna be a layer between the dirty water and basically the clean water that is resulting. And as that dirt builds up, you start getting more and more buildup on the different media. What you have here is your water, your pressure differential starts increasing, your flow starts decreasing, and eventually then you'll have to clean it, whether manually or automatically. It just depends upon what technology you're using. Now, in non-barrier filters, these are centrifugal action separators. Separators act really as a, a tornado. Let's think of it that way. It's all, a lot of people call them a hydrocyclone. These are not really a hydrocyclone, but they act like that. You've got dirty water coming in, and the des internal design of the separators essentially get the water to spin at a high rate of speed, creating a vortex and a small tornado within the separation chamber. And just like with the tornado, 
you got the eye that in the middle that's very quiet. Well, that's where your cleanest water is down in the middle. And then your clean water will go out the top and your dirt is separated out and will collect in the collection chamber and periodically removed. So that's your barriers and your non-barriers. Now looking at the, these options and then the challenges with each of these options. On the barrier filters, there's the different technologies um, pose slightly different challenges. Sand filters, there's a lot of moving parts on the systems because you've got some, you know, you've got to back flush these systems. So the frequent maintenance is really going to be on the moving parts. They're going to have to backwash periodically once the pressure differential for the in intake versus the outtake hits a particular pressure differential. So that water either has to be purged to a drain, purged to a holding tank, and then that water has to be handled some other way. And of course, as the dirt bed builds, the flow reduces and the pressure differential increases. So you're always going to have that fluctuating system. It's very similar in cartridge filters. Cartridge filters, unlike sand filters, really these are more maintenance intensive. They're going to, they'll do a great job, but you do need to change or, and or clean these cartridges periodically because um, they're going to build up dirt and that's, that's all you can do. You got to eventually dispose of them. And just like any of these, as the dirt builds up, flow is going to decrease and your pressure differential is going to increase. Screen filters are very good also. Um, the thing we have to think about is the parts per million that these technologies can handle. Um, a screen filter, and I'll look at this a little bit closer later, I'll give you some information, um, maybe too much information, but you'll see it when I get to it. These require pretty clean water to actually work if you don't want to be back flushing all the time. So in terms of parts per million that they can handle, the barrier filters, of course, will, will fill up quicker the, the higher your solids load is, and so they're going to require lots of backwash. Your centrifugal separators, now, they don't, they're not magic either. To operate, they do require a minimum pressure differential from the inlet to the outlet. And that minimum differential is required to create the vortex within the separator. Because without that, vortex won't be created and the separators won't really do a good job. Um, and they're also going to require a steady and constant pressure loss. Whereas these, as barrier filters, when they start out, they start out at maybe one or two PSID and they'll build up to 7, 10, 18 PSID, depending upon what they're set for. Whereas a separator, it will have a minimum PSID of three, maybe upwards to 12 PSID, and that'll be a constant. Of course, the good side of that is, of course, you can plan on that. Now, one thing I would look at is the filtration capacity. When you're looking at a system, a cooling tower system, any cooling system, water-cooled system, generally we're looking at the type of filtration we're using and where we're gonna put the filters. And I talked about side stream earlier. And I'll get back to this more. Generally, we're looking at around 20%, 10%, 5%, and 3% side stream filtration of the entire system. The problem with that is if you're using, say, 20% side stream as an example, that means at any given time, 80% of the flow is going past not being filtered. These are Most of these are closed loop or semi-closed loop, they're in open cooling towers, so dirt's constantly coming in. But at any given time, you're only gonna see 20%, 10%, 5%, or 3% of that flow. So that's the problem here as particles, especially in arid areas where if you're in, or I don't know, Western US, I'll say for sure, um, where you'd have more blowing dirt, you do have constant intake of debris, a small filtration or a small percentage side stream is often not good for the system as it can't keep up with it. So this, this undersizing leads to insufficient particle removal. So we got to think about your own environment and your own needs is just because the filter works, all the filters work, they, they definitely work, but it just doesn't mean that they effectively remove everything. So you have to think about sizing your filtration system to the needs of your actual system. Now, I talked about coming to some more detailed information. This slide is packed with a lot of information. And what it is, 
It's a cost analysis uh, and looking at sand filters, screen filters, cartridge filters, and centrifugal separators, two different types of systems. There's a lot of information on here. So what I've done is I'm, I basically, I'm taking half this information in the next two slides. I'm gonna break it in half to make it easier to digest and, and, and see. So this first slide is what we just looked at. These are the technologies. This is a centrifugal separator system with a zero water loss option. We say zero water loss option, which means that all the solids that are removed are continually run into a solids recovery vessel, an SRV. So there is no water back flush, no water put down the drain. These are zero water loss options. The second system is actually a system that captures water, but the water is purged on a time basis down to drain. This is a cartridge filter system with disposable cartridges. This is a screen filter system, automatic self-cleaning screen filter system, and this, these are sand filter, traditional sand filters with automatic backflush. These, these are all looked at as a 3,000 gallon per minute system. And the reason why that was done is a colleague of ours actually had an application installed that they installed with a 3,000 gallon per minute, 20 micron removal sand filter system. So we took an actual and, and compared the rest of these technologies to the actual. So we can kind of get an apples to apples comparison. The things, the differences here, we start looking at some other nuances then of the different technologies. And one is your maximum solids loading capabilities of the different technologies. Sand filters generally are designed for handling up to about 200 parts per million at a given time. Too much more than that, and you're, they're gonna be in back flush too often. You lose a lot more water. Same thing with screen filters and cartridge filters. These are generally designed for a maximum of around 100 ppm. They're small, but that small space does not allow them to collect too many solids at a given time. Otherwise, again, they'll be in constant back flush. So these are generally designed for around 100 parts per million. Separators, because there's no barrier, these actually can go up to 5,000 parts per million. That's half a percent of solids. So that's one huge difference in terms of centrifugal separators. Next, we're looking at backwash flow rate. The zero water discharge has, of course, no backwash. The Leco system with an automatic purge doesn't necessarily doesn't backwash, but it will purge solids to drain. The cartridge filters do not clean themselves. They're gonna, it's not applicable for this, but screen filters and Sand filters definitely have, um, in, in their backwash cycles, they will lose sizable amounts of water. Depending upon um, the sis situation and how long they backflush, these flows can vary. But in terms of overall use in a year, this is one thing I wanted to look at, is how much water in a year is lost. Obviously, in the zero backflush system with the solid recovery vessel, there's no water loss. In a Lakos purge to drain system, you're gonna lose around 40,000 gallons a year. And then again, this is comparing to a 3,000 gallon a minute system. Cartridge filters, real, it's not applicable for them. Screen filters, you're gonna lose about 650,000 gallons of water a year. And in sand filters, it's well over 2 million gallons of water a year. Again, on a 3,000 gallon per minute system. Now you start looking at energy. So we start looking at energy Usage, the separators require 100 horsepower pumps. Cartridge filters is not, it's working off of the system's pump. The screen filters are gonna also require a 100 horsepower pump. And the sand filters for 3,000 gallons per minute are requiring four 60 horsepower pumps. And you start looking at energy usage per year, we're around 92,000, $92,000 a year. $92,000 a year and over $200,000 a year. Chemical usage is negligible. Chemical usage really only comes up in sand filters and this is depending upon the system. It could be upwards on a 3,000 gallon a minute system, upwards $30,000 a year, but generally it just depends on what water quality is of the given site. In terms of media used, 
bag filters are going to be used here for sure it's no water loss but you're going to use bag filters you're going to use every week you're going to have to change this would be a three around bag housing so you're going to use three bags per week that's around 160 bags a year no bags here no no, no barrier here cartridges is this is where your cartridge filters really start showing up on the radar these are to do 3,000 gallons a minute they're going to use two 12 around housings which means 24 cartridges and if you're removing those every week and say you can clean them once so you say you, you only have to use half as many you're going to use around 624 cartridges per year um, that adds up in terms of price so and the media is really only once a year for changing the media and screen filters are cleanable you don't really need to change the screen but you do need to stop and clean the screens so at the end of the day, we start looking at our total operating costs. And again, you have to look at this as an operator. Uh, it, some of these things look higher than others, but you have to look at what you're getting and what you want to do for your system. Next, we've got multiple filtration options that Lakos can offer. Separators can go up to 12,000 gallons per minute as standalone. Generally, these would be as pre-filters or full flow filters. Uh, we have Laco systems. The systems can go up to over 6,000 gallons per minute. These can filter on, on a recirculating basis down to 25 micron at 98%. Um, but also with a cartridge filter side stream, what we call a plus system, you can filter down to five micron. So you can get as fine as you need to go. And then the sand filters and screen filters are also available. Sand filter systems, just the single systems, can go around 1,000 gallons a minute apiece, and the screen filters can do well over 7,000 gallons if, if need be. So the technologies are all available. Now some retrofit options. I wanted to throw this in real quick. I know we're running to the end here, but I wanted to show you this before I kind of moved on, was that in terms of retrofit systems, you may have a system already, in, already built, operating, and either you don't have filtration, or you have existing filtration that's either not working well or you're not happy with. And retrofits are common for us. Um, it's easily to replace existing, for instance here, I'm just using an example of a sand filter or any other type of filter with a LACO system. LACO systems also can act as great pre-filters to an existing system. If your existing system is not doing well, it's getting overrun with solids, you can easily put a, a Lakos separator in front of it to take the load off and allow your existing system to work better. And these are all turnkey systems with pump, strainer, everything all on a purge or on a skid. Um, we're showing here, this as an example, 600 GPM skid system is only 36 inches by 60 inches in footprint. So your footprint is very small. In terms of support, for especially for the data center operators and their contractors. Lakos has been at this for 48 years. We have distribution set up all over North, South America, Europe, Middle East, Asia, Australia, New Zealand. We've got uh, distribution set up all over. We've got long-standing partners that are very knowledgeable. So we're happy to help you know, match you up um, if you wanna work direct with them. Again, great partnerships. A uh, lot of knowledge out there for you to, to work with. So we welcome any calls that uh, you want to want to make with us and we can help you get put together with a local partner. Then finally, just kind of in a nutshell, the advantages is no filter maintenance with a, a separator system, zero water loss option, collecting it all on a solids recovery vessel. We have the smallest footprint out there we do maintain your downstream equipment efficiencies by putting filtration on. I think whatever filtration you use, um, really that's the thing you gotta think about is maintaining those downstream efficiencies. All of our separators are third-party efficiency tested. So we'd be happy to share that information with you. And again, just what I just spoke about is our worldwide partner support that's also available to you. This is where it comes in from your standpoint, the operator. We have to look at what's important to you. And these are the questions that we'd like to have conversations with you, or you need to think about yourselves in terms of what kind of maintenance you can put up with or don't want, what kind of manpower you have 
Um, you look at your usage, your power usage, your water usage, what can you do to save on that? You look at your space constraints for the available filtration that you want to put in, uh, whether or not you need to inventory parts. Some of these filtration technologies do recommend that you have some parts in inventory. And you look at, of course, the retrofit options of uh, installations you already have operating, and of course, what support you're going to get from us, the manufacturer. So that, I know I felt like I ran through it myself, uh, but I want to thank you uh, for your time. And at this point, if anybody's got any questions or comments, I'd be happy to take them. But I'm also on the screen, I have my name, I have our website here with, you can go directly to our data center page if you'd like. You're welcome to give me a call or text me if you have any questions. I can get you to the right people if you want to do something locally. But all in all, thank you for your time. Uh, I hope you got at least something out of this. Uh, and I'll look forward to any questions. I have one question here I want to want to comment on. The question was, the inside of the separator is carbon steel. Well, it, our separators can either be carbon steel, and it's not about the inside of the separator, it's about the total separator. Separators can be made with carbon steel, 304 stainless steel, 316L stainless steel. Uh, we can do duplex stainless steel, super duplex stainless steel. So there's, depending upon the water quality and the location, we can do well beyond carbon steel. Frankly, most applications are carbon steel. And I have a question here about, would you explain, this is from Paul Yang, would you explain what is the pre-filtration for the existing system? Um, pre-filtration really is if you have an existing system that's already installed, say it's a cartridge filter or a screen filter, and they're collecting a lot of dirt and they're needing to be serviced or maintained often. We can put a separator prior to that, prior to that technology to help take the, the large particles out, take the load off of the cartridge filter or screen filter so they don't have to be cleaned or backwashed so often. That's what I mean by, by pre-filtration to existing systems. And I have another question here concerning the centrifugal filtration system. Are these main, are these uh, maintenance free via, via the auto purge valve? Yes, when I talked about no maintenance and I talk about zero water loss, this is a great question. Stephen, I, or Stephen, I appreciate it because this I didn't go into this. Um, when you look at a Lakos centrifugal system, we talk about zero maintenance and we talk about zero water loss. These are options that we need to look at from an end user standpoint. The zero water loss means we're going to use a solids recovery vessel to collect the solids. They're not going to be backwashed or purged to a drain anywhere. We're going to collect them. Well, periodically, that collection is going to get full, and someone's going to have to pull, pull the bag out and replace the bag. So that's zero water loss, but there is going to be some maintenance. Now, the zero maintenance uh, is an automatic purge valve. This is correct. Your question is correct. So using an automatic purge valve, the separator has the capability of collecting solids in its collection chamber, and then periodically on a timed basis, that purge collect that purge uh, chamber is going to be evacuated via an automatic purge valve. So that's your zero maintenance. All right. Well, again, I'll be happy to answer and take any more questions offline. Uh, you have my uh, email address, phone number. Contact me anytime. You're welcome to contact the office in, at any time as well. Um, you can come through our website with any questions or concerns as well. Um, so again, thank you and have a good day or good evening.